House Leader, third party. Thank you, Honourable, question, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And speaking of charades, under the previous government, despite population growth and increased resource activity, our environmental protection in this province, monitoring and our environmental protection, monitoring and enforcement capacity was crippled by budget and staff cuts. They found fewer infractions because they weren't looking. Earlier this session, we spoke about illegal dams being built in BC without government permitting or oversight, a case where a citizen spoke up to identify problems that the government wouldn't. This week, another concerned C C British Columbian, Tavish Campbell, has stepped forward, this time with videos of blood pouring out of underwater pipes. The blood, he's told us, is coming from farmed salmon, and it is contaminated with Piscine Rio virus, a potential risk to our wild salmon stocks. While I appreciate the Minister of Environment's immediate response to the videos, we need a government that works to proactively protect our environment, not one that waits for the public to prove that we've got a problem. My question through you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Campbell dove at two out of the 109 fish processing plants in BC. Is the Minister going to expand his review to cover every plant that releases effluent into wild salmon habitat to ensure it's not contaminated? Or will Mr. Campbell need to keep testing the blood water? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. But I also want to thank uh, Tavish Campbell for uh, bringing this issue to the attention of the government and uh, the public of BC and Canada. It is important uh, to view that video is visceral, and I had the same reaction that British Columbians and Canadians did. What is going on here? So I looked into it, and I found out that under the previous government, the last inspection of this fish processing plant was in 2013, and despite the fact that the plant was out of compliance at that inspection, no further inspection took place. No further inspection took place. So I dug a little further, Honourable Speaker. We have over 7,000 permits to inspect and a handful of inspectors to do it. Notwithstanding that, I've asked inspectors to go to, uh, to the uh, Browns Bay processing plant. I've asked them to inspect what's going on there. We will review the samples that were taken by Mr. Campbell, and if we need greater certainty, we will take additional samples. The permits for Browns Bay are being reviewed. They are three decades old. The conditions on them are three decades old. We will be reviewing the conditions to ensure they meet the expectations of British Columbians that nothing, nothing goes into our ocean that has contaminants or pathogens, that it's clean, and that we protect wild salmon in British Columbia. And we will apply those conditions to all the permits for fish processing plants in British Columbia because, because Honourable Speaker, we're here to protect wild salmon, the 10,000 jobs that depend on them, and the Indigenous people who depend on them for food. House Leader, third party on a supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister of Environment's passion on protecting our oceans. I share that with him. And yet there are so many examples of communities and individuals in our province having to step up where the government hasn't been there to protect our waterways and our marine environment. The health sick nation feels forced to set up their own Indigenous Marine Response Centre because they know the government has not been able to protect their waters in the face of a major spill. This week, Premier Notley and Minister Carr are in town to try to sell to British Columbians the Kinder Morgan pipeline. The BC Liberals like to say that we have a world-class oil spill response regime to deal with spills. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
The so-called world-class spill response is based on near-perfect conditions that include, incredibly, 20 hours of sunlight. These fictitious conditions exist exactly nowhere in BC. My question through you, Honourable Speaker, is again to the Minister of Environment. Other jurisdictions are coming here to sell British Columbians this project on the scientifically inaccurate premise that we have a world-class spill response. Do you agree that the spill response regime based on conditions that don't actually exist cannot be world class? Minister of the Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you again to the member. And first, let me say uh, to the members of the Haltzik Nation, to the two crew members of the Jake Shearer who went onto the barge uh, and anchored it to prevent it from going on the rocks, to the many Ministry of Environment staff and Coast Guard staff who prevented a catastrophe. Thank you on behalf of all British Columbia. It was a combination of hard work, determination, but also a measure of luck. Uh, the Haltzuk have now, twice within a year, faced one real catastrophe and one potential catastrophe. So even before this incident, I had arranged to go and meet with Chief Slett and members of the nation in Bella Bella uh, in mid-December, and I look forward to doing that. I know one of the things we'll be asked is whether we support Indigenous response capacity on the Central Coast, and I can say that we do. And we will urge the federal government to work with the Haltzuk and with uh, other nations and with the provincial government to implement that. As to the rest of uh, the member's question, there are flaws. There were flaws in the hearing process, we believe. That's why we went to the federal court to defend BC's interests, to defend our coast. It doesn't matter, honorable speaker, if spill response is world class, if it's not effective and it's not adequate, we're here to defend BC's interests and BC's coast, and we will do that.